Good morning and welcome to today's Engaging for Missouri webinar. I'm Alice Roach from the University of Missouri and I'll be your host today. With each of these 30 minute presentations, we intend to share research based insights that leaders like you can apply in your own work to benefit and strengthen the state's agriculture and food system, hospitality sector, economy, communities and families. Today, Scott Brown will share a presentation focused on food price inflation. But before we, be we begin, I do want to share a few housekeeping notes. First, we'll close today with a Q&A session. Those of you who connected today via your computers may submit your questions in the chat screen. If you join today by phone, then you may email me your questions at roacham at missouri.edu. Second, all attendees are muted and may not start their video. Third, if you encounter any technical problems during today's presentation, then you can let us know by either submitting a comment in the chat screen or you can send me an email at roacham at missouri.edu and I'll do my best to help you troubleshoot. And last, we will make a recording of today's presentation available. You can look for an email tomorrow that shares more about where you can access that recording. And you can also find an archive of previous Engaging for Missouri webinars on our Division of Applied Social Sciences YouTube channel. So now we'll transition to the topic of today's presentation, which is titled, Will Food Price Inflation Slow in Late 2022? Presenting today is Scott Brown, who's an Associate Extension Professor of Agricultural and Applied Economics. So thanks, Scott, for presenting today. If you could please unmute your microphone and start your video, then we can begin today's presentation. Thanks very much, uh, Allison, and, and good morning to all of you. Uh, I, I will say the, uh, the, the daunting task of uh, forecasting food prices in the environment that we're in right now is... Uh, certainly uh, has its own set of, of challenges, but uh, I want to spend my, my time with you today just talking about what I see uh, a, as we look ahead. And, and I will keep saying I, I think the, the rate of food inflation will slow as we continue through 2022, but thus far uh, the data that we've had from uh, BLS has proved me wrong. So hopefully uh, as, as we go forward, uh, we'll, we'll find uh, that we do see some slowdown in terms of food inflation. So as I start this morning, kind of start at maybe the 30,000 foot view with you for, for a minute. So as we think about that consumer dollar and how much of it comes from the farm level, uh, USDA data that we have available says, you know, roughly 16 cents of that dollar is, is the farm share and the remaining 84 cents is, is the marketing share. I, I spend a minute here just to remind us in terms of what drives food prices or food price inflation uh, as we see the farm share generally that's continued to decline over the long term. Um, more and more, it's going to be the other costs of getting that product from the farm level, ultimately to the grocery store or to the, the table uh, at, at whatever uh, establishment that, that we're eating at. So. But let's make sure we understand kind of the relative pieces. Now, I'm not saying farm prices don't matter. As we go further into this discussion, I think you're going to see uh, that, that farm level prices have mattered in terms of that overall food CPI. Um, my, my other piece that, that I think is worth sharing is that, you know, we continue to change how we consume food in this country. When you look at a uh, percentage of total food expenditures that, that occur on food away from home, uh, so when you and I go out uh, to, to eat at, at a dining establishment, it's been growing. Now, I want to be a little careful with this graph. The scale's fairly uh, narrow on the left side here, but growth over the past 25 years or so. Uh, you know, yes, COVID changed that. Uh, 2020, we, we didn't go out and eat. Uh, we came back some in 2021. I expect the 2022 data gets us back on track. So. The, the days of uh, food consumption occurring by shoppers going to the grocery store and, and picking up food is, is continuing to change. And, and we're much more focused on that away from home uh, consumption. I think that matters uh, as we start to talk about uh, the, the CPI for food as, as I try to forecast here. Now, I, I spent time there just to remind us that, you know, when you look at the food at home, so in this case, it's the dollar bill on the right side. Uh, food at home, a larger proportion of that dollar gets back to the farm share. 
So 23.3 uh, cents in, in this case for food at home. So it just tells you food away from home, much more uh, sensitive to, to the marketing portion of that uh, activity. And, and again, I'll just keep saying that farm share likely continues to go down when you look at total food dollars. So the left-hand side, like the first dollar bill, um, as more food away from home is, is where we head, I think that farm share continues to go lower. Before getting to the CPI for food, I, I want to at least remind us that there's no simple single measure of retail prices. And I, I look at retail meat prices here because I have two alternatives uh, for us. I've picked retail bacon prices only because bacon's so good. Uh, no, not really. It's just a, an easy one to compare. So the Agricultural Marketing Service of USDA actually does their own survey weekly of retail meat prices. Now, that survey is very different than the Bureau of Labor Statistics survey of retail bacon prices. AMS, in this case, is sending folks out to grocery stores to see what the uh, price being uh, that, that's typical in that store for the week and, and report that back. So it might not be uh, as scientific, if you will, as the process that BLS goes through. However, the AMS survey will in fact capture some specialing that, that, that goes on or specials that go on uh, for the different products. Uh, in, in the case of bacon here, I will say the AMS data would suggest a more weakness in bacon prices the last couple of three months than what BLS is suggesting. So I think part of that is there are some opportunities for specials that will you know, reduce uh, the effective price that's being captured in that AMS data. So I encourage all of us to, to, to remind ourselves that how we measure retail prices matter in terms of you know, the, the, the final reporting. So BLS not doing those specials, um, they're, they're likely going to be maybe perhaps a little slower in getting the downside price movement that might come first with stores deciding to, to give cents off or some other uh, opportunity to get prices lower. So I have a, a few slides here next that are going to look similar. Uh, first of all, I just want to spend a minute. So the food commodity index, uh, let me describe the blue line for us uh, to begin with. It is more of a farm level aggregate food price series. So meats are in, uh, grains and oil seeds are in, but think of it as the, the, the best we might have in an aggregate farm level price. Uh, here the orange line is, is the CPI for food at home. And you'll notice that I'm going to spend the next few slides really focused on the food at home CPI so I can look at some components. I, I put this slide in first because I just wanted to make sure I said out loud, farm level prices are much more volatile than retail prices. So when you look at uh, the, the blue line, we certainly get a lot more movements up and down. Um, that, than we do in the overall CPI for food because I want to go to, to this next slide and now I'm going to push that CPI for food at home percentage change onto the right hand side of this graph. Um, and, and, and I'm doing that because I don't think it takes much for us to realize there's some pretty strong correlation uh, between the, the CPI for food at home and this farm level food commodity index. It's not perfect by any stretch. And, and yes, we'll talk about some different lags here in, in a minute, because you can see points in time where they don't move in lockstep period to period. It takes time uh, before the CPI for food at home probably changes uh, relative to a change in that food commodity index. I will note for you, uh, so the very right-hand side, the last few months of 2022, what has happened, we have seen a modest decline in the food commodity index the last few months. Um, not, not enough to suggest a big 
downturn in the CPI uh, for food at home, I guess, at this point, but but a modest decline after what was a, a fairly steady increase for a number of months. So um, I, I will just remind us, the farm level prices matter. I mean, this graph clearly shows, you know, that correlation exists. Now, I think a lot of us look at some of the other costs along the way. I just did one of, of diesel fuel prices, which by the way, diesel fuel prices are much more volatile than uh, the corresponding CPI for food at home. Those energy costs matter as we're talking about transporting products uh, from the farm level to, to the grocery store. Um, higher diesel fuel prices have certainly added uh, to the, the, the cost of food that's ultimately getting to the grocery store. Again, we can begin to see there's lags in terms of how quickly uh, that information is transmitted in terms of higher diesel prices through to uh, the CPI for food ad. But, but there is strong correlation there as well. Now, it's not just diesel fuel or energy costs that matter. So here, trying to construct an overall, if you will, a producer price index for marketing costs. So roughly 50% labor, 30% uh, energy related cost. We were looking at data uh, available from the Economic Research Service of USDA that kind of helped us with those weights for an overall marketing cost index. The very strong correlation as labor goes up, as these other input costs go up, it does affect uh, the, the CPI for food uh, that that we report. So now, I, I think this is the point that is important as I visit with you all this morning. So the correlation of the CPI for food at home with those uh, components. So both, right? So we were re really looking at T, the the current period when we are looking at those graphs. The correlation component, input components relative to the CPI for food. The, the idea, and, and people have said this forever, it's sticky. Uh, so we don't tend to see uh, an immediate increase in the CPI for food as these input components rise. It takes time. Perhaps that's why we've yet to see much of a slowdown or, or uh, re reduction in in the percentage growth in the CPI for food at home so far. But, you know, we, we can look out almost a year down the road and still see some fairly strong correlation. I, I, I go, I think this is very easily uh, described as retailers don't like to pass those increases along immediately. They want to do it over time because they also want to try to keep from moving them up and down uh, a, a lot month to month. Consumers get used to what are normal prices. And, and, and so I think they're, they're trying to be staged in terms of that approach. Uh, we'll, we'll see uh, how long the stickiness continues, but we don't want to forget uh, just because farm prices have begun to come down for a number of things, it takes time. Um, it, it reminds me of, you know, recently someone uh, said that chicken wing prices were back below pre-COVID levels. And, you know, they, they all knew that I was a chicken wing connoisseur. So why did I not know this? Well, wholesale chicken wing prices have come below pre-COVID levels, but retail chicken wing prices have stayed very high. So this idea of it takes time. Uh, for any kind of, of reduction to uh, work its way through the system. So I think this graph certainly provides you know, that kind of, of needed information about just how long it takes for transmission from different input components to ultimately the CPI for food at home. Now, I want to remind us as we start to look at, at some components, so I have just some selected ones. 
there is no simple one story to this uh, current situation. I, I will say the, the orange line without any uh, markers on it is, is beef. Beef's been going down over time. Let me be careful about what I say here. The rate of growth in the CPI for beef has been declining. It's, it's not negative, but beef might have been more of an issue in terms of late 2021, where less of an issue today. The, the flip side for eggs, uh, eggs were uh, not creating a lot of food inflation in, until we really got to April of 2022. And I think there's uh, some high path AI issues going on, uh, strong egg demand as well also going on. But those two kind of uh, highlight that we've got components that are still rising at a very rapid rate relative to historical standards, others that are starting to come down. Uh, fats and oils continues to be strong in, in the data that we got from BLS uh, this week. Uh, poultry is starting to turn lower. Um, I've, I've spent most of my time here with you today you know, talking about the CPI for food at home. I will say the, the food away from home one, I think is one that will continue to generate some longer term upward uh, pressure as again, I think labor costs continue to stay relatively high. Uh, Dairy is another one that has really been contributing more uh, as you look at the latest data. So even though we're starting to see some lower farm level milk prices, uh, we're really now just starting to see uh, some much higher uh, retail prices to consumers. So um, it, it is a mixed bag. I, I encourage everyone to think carefully about the components if you're going to do your own kind of forecasting of, of any of these categories. All right, so someone reminded me, one of my mentors uh, from, from several years yesterday, if you're going to forecast, you should forecast often. Uh, I, I think that's certainly going to be the case uh, in this forecast of the CPI for food at home because I'm going to be wrong. But this is my best kind of shot at what I expect as we go through the next several months. The red line is the last point of data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So that 13 uh, plus percent increase uh, in, in the the uh, CPI for food at home was the August data. I think we're going to weaken as we go through the remainder of 2022. That may look awful, uh, like an awful big decline. It's it's similar to some others. You know, I go back to 2009, 2010. You see another period of time now. That was really general economy slowing down that created some of that. But, but generally, when you see periods where this blue line increases at a faster rate than, than kind of trend, if you will, it, it eventually does turn down. The, the turn down just isn't as strong as the up. And, and so, again, another case where I won't be surprised when we get into 2023 to actually talk about a CPI for food at home, that's got some negative to it. Um, again, I will say there are a lot of reasons why this could change dramatically, but I keep expecting some slowdown in the rate of growth. We just haven't experienced it yet. I always hate to call the turn uh, given everything that's been going on. So I, I, I wanna cl close here and, and get to questions by just reminding us there are a lot of wild cards. So general economy, uh, if we slow down, talk about a, a deeper recession, you know, that, that probably reduces some demand for some of these food products. Uh, it, it might end up with some lower labor costs that could make the CPI for food even fall uh, throughout uh, much of 2023. So we, we don't know exactly what that economy is going to look like as we, as we look ahead. Uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict continues. Uh, we know we've had some energy, uh, direct energy price effects from that. Uh, wheat prices have have likely stayed higher than otherwise would be, be the case. We in, in the forecast that I have for you, there's really no major additional disruption. So uh, a, a change in that conflict, which 
as we look day by day, you know, there, there are certainly changes, ebbs and flows, if you will. So um, a, a more extreme conflict might keep that CPI stronger than otherwise would be the case. And of course, drought and weather plays a big impact as well. Uh, you know, we've been seeing some modest uh, revisions in crop yields for the crop we have in the ground right now. If that were to continue, or if we were to talk about dry weather next year, we have relatively tight stocks. So that could keep uh, crop prices higher. Uh, that does spill over into to livestock as well. Um, you know, we're, we're in a situation where droughts have certainly affected cattle markets. So if, if uh, you know, where, where we see cattle right now, I think a lot tighter beef supplies in the second half of 2023, which could, act, could, could increase that CPI for beef in particular. But if drought continues, we keep liquidating cows and push more beef production on the market in the short run uh, would have the opposite effect. So th th there's certainly a lot of wild cards uh, that we have to this outlook, but uh, I, I appreciate the chance uh, to visit with you all this morning and I think we're ready for questions. Yes, we certainly are. Thank you, Scott, for presenting and for sharing your forecast for that CPI for food. That's good insight for everyone on the call. If you do have questions, we do still have time. So please include those in the chat screen. We're, we're happy to take your questions. Um, Scott, as a place to start, you showed some different wild cards that could affect the outlook uh, for food prices. And one of those was an economic slowdown or recession. Some debate is ongoing about whether we may already be in a recession. So what are some food related factors that we could look for that would indicate that maybe we have entered a recession? Yeah, so I, so I think, you know, we have seen a, a, a slowdown in economic activity already. Some will define that we're in a recession already. I, I, I will say from a food perspective, for me, it's when do we start to see demand soft, soften for uh, many of these food products? I'll take meat in particular. We've seen nothing but very strong demand for many of these meat products, even in the face of high fuel prices, uh, higher interest rates. So there hasn't been, to this point, any real change in demand for beef, pork, chicken, et cetera, that if, if we start to see signs of those slowdowns, I, I Maybe I should be a little more cautious here in the discussion. I have seen some change in habits here. So some consumers buying down. If you look at uh, beef in particular for this case, so higher, higher ground beef prices have typically been where we've uh, seen uh, ground beef in 2022, lower steak prices. I, I view some of that as this buy down of I'm now not consuming as much steak and I'm consuming more ground beef. Um, so we're seeing maybe the beginning signs, but not this general shift of you know, weaker demand for meat generally. That, that's what I'm continuing to pay attention to in terms of starting to say the general economy is having a real impact. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we do have an audience question here. Do you expect the push to change to sustainable or regenerative agriculture or the current regulation and label reviews on the Hill, like the Atrazine review, to become wild cards as well? So uh, I think the, sh the, the short answer here is for sure that those can be an, an issue. I, I will say generally when we talk about regulatory changes, um, we're going to add cost uh, to, to the equation. Uh, that's not me saying necessarily uh, additional regulations are good or bad, but we, we know generally if those regulations make changes in how we're going to produce a product or get a product from the farm to, to the grocery store, we're likely adding costs. So uh, any congressional action there uh, would uh, typically uh, only increase uh, what, what I think the CPI for food might look like. I'm not sure I expect large changes from that, but I know the direction. Great, thank you. Another policy related question here. Um, the current farm bill expires in 2023. So how do you project that the recent food price inflation trends will shape policymaker decisions about uh, farm bill titles that address nutrition and fund programs such as SNAP? So I think that'll be a big, 
big piece of the discussion of the farm bill when we think about uh, the fact that the farm bill more than three quarters of it probably today is is focused on SNAP and, and nutrition programs. Uh, I, I will say the, the very high prices that we have for the CPI for food today uh, th does not affect consumers equally across the spectrum of income levels. Those in the lowest income levels are probably the ones having the toughest time uh, with higher prices. Um, and, and so I think we are going to have to think about what does that safety net look like uh, for consumers? Um, the, the flip side of that is I think there is a, a discussion to, to be had on the producer side of what is an adequate safety net. You know, you come out of what in the worst of COVID was a lot of payments to producers through CFAP program. We had the, the AMS uh, food box uh, program trying to help cons consumers. This idea of what's that safety net really look like or what's it need to be? Uh, you, you know, we want to provide an ad adequate safety net for, and I'll say both producers and consumers, uh, but, but, you know, what kind of costs can we have there? Um, I, I just think when you look at the kinds of, of prices that we're seeing today for food, it's going to get the attention of folks on the Hill in terms of how to address uh the, the, the rapid run up. W w whether we can have much impact through that farm bill process might be another question, but uh, certainly going to be front and center for the discussion. Great. Thank you. Another audience question here. Um, given the tightness of carryover crop stocks, some liquidation of beef inventories due to drought conditions, continued aviation disease or av yeah, avian rather <laughs> disease pressures on production, continued pressure on energy prices, how can you foresee any significant negative pressures on food prices? So I, 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 th that's actually a very good question. All right. So I, I will say we are doing a lot on the supply side to keep prices high. I, I say we're doing a lot. The supply side has been tight in a number of areas. I, I, I guess my point here is about the CPI for food and, and those individual components. So we've kind of ramped up prices for many of our farm level commodities, but, but they're not continuing to go higher. They, they've kind of plateaued in many cases, some coming down. Um, I, I think then that gives us an opportunity for the, the less rapid growth relative to what we've seen over the past uh, 16 months or so. So I'm not suggesting a big downturn. I'm suggesting just the rate of growth slows considerably if you uh you know go back to the to the to the blue line here um we're, we're never getting anywhere near where we started 2021 in terms of the level of the cpi for food at home we're just slowing that rate of growth so uh, again i agree that uh we're certainly seeing the supply side of many of these industries tighter uh than, than we've seen for a while which probably keeps prices uh, higher in the short run at the farm level, but we're not continuing to grow them. Um, we'll, we'll, you know, sometimes I will say, tell me what yields look like next year around the globe. Tell me what happens to the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So what's been tight supplies could change relatively quickly, uh, by the way, to, to much larger um, supplies than we've seen for the last couple of years. Great, thank you. Um, sort of follow-up question to that, and you've written on this topic quite a bit already, but you talked about how one of the wild cards um, would be how beef production could be strong in the next year if drought intensifies, but that also has some long-term implications, right, if we reduce the herd size. So what are those long-term implications if that herd size overall throughout the country continues to decline? Yep. So, so we, I believe, are going to push longer-term record uh, beef prices at consumers. Uh, when, when you see what forecasts uh, for beef production are from many of the folks that are in that business, significant declines in beef production um, for 2023 already. Uh, you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back and say, if you think about, you know, where we were the last time we had really good cattle prices, 2014, the, the decline in beef production in that year is very similar to what we may face uh, in 2023. So we, we can see uh, much larger uh, price increases 
again, I'm kind of assuming we don't continue that drought in 2023. 2024, 2025, keep pushing higher. Um, I, I think we have a couple of things at play. Number one, um, ju just dry weather. It's going to take us a while to turn that ship back around and get beef cow inventory to grow again. And, and number two, the economics haven't been there. Um, I, I kind of quietly look at there's a lot of smaller beef cow operations that I'm curious about their long-term strategy. And, and I say that because it tends to be an older population. So if they choose to get out of the business, is there someone else that's going to come along and pick up those um, smaller operations? I think much of the, uh, and I'll say kids here in this case, but family uh, are, are likely doing something else than uh, running those 30 and 40 cow operations. So I, I think it takes longer to turn the ship this time and get beef cow inventory to grow. So higher prices for consumers, maybe for a longer period of time. I worry under that scenario that uh, demand for beef somehow starts to erode as consumers begin to find some cheaper alternatives, which they frankly really haven't had. Pork and chicken prices have also been higher as we've looked the last couple of years. But if we start to separate beef from pork and chicken retail prices, maybe consumers start to make some shifts. Maybe restaurants start featuring some different products. Yeah, great perspective there. Well, thank you, Scott, for presenting. We do appreciate your insights. It's time to go ahead and close today's webinar. Thanks to our audience for joining us as well. You'll see a post-webinar survey will either have already loaded in your browser or it will load in your browser soon. Please consider responding to that survey as we use the results to improve the webinar experience and also brainstorm future webinar topics. Again, sometime tomorrow, you should receive a copy of today's presentation. It's a YouTube link that you'll receive. Plus, you'll receive a link to download the presentation slides. Our next Engaging for Missouri webinar is scheduled for 2 p.m. on Wednesday, September 28th. Scott will join us again, and he and Bob Maltzberger from the Rural and Farm Finance Policy Analysis Center will present Understanding the Fall 2022 Missouri Farm Income Outlook. Again, thanks for joining us, and I hope you have a great Wednesday. Thanks again, Scott.